cliffcentral.com and a special guest that I've been looking forward to speaking to for some time. Uh, we've actually been talking on, on WhatsApp and I completely forgot to get back to him like an idiot for a long time. And then eventually he messaged me out of the blue and he said, hey, are we still doing this thing or are you going to mess me around for the rest of my life? His name is Chris Wyatt. He uh, has spent 36 and a half years in the US Army. He spent 34 of those years on active duty, 23 of them overseas. He retired as a full colonel in the U.S. Army. He's an intelligence officer. He's done tours of duty in Germany, uh, in Italy, Tunisia, Lib Liberia, which, of course, is here in Africa. You can talk about Botswana, Malawi, Niger, Niger uh, Mauritania, Uganda, and Ethiopia, among other things. He's a regional specialist for Africa, and he speaks six languages. Three of them are actually African languages. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the show, Chris. How are you? Well, thanks a lot, Gareth. I'm quite well, but we should let people know that probably the reason we had a disconnect is uh, I guess people have abandoned WhatsApp. So maybe you weren't checking your WhatsApp for a while. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I wish that was true. I'm still very much in the clutches of Mark Zuckerberg, whether I, I like it or not. And um, I think many of us feel that way, even though we've tried Signal and Telegram and all of these other things, you end up coming back because everybody's on WhatsApp. So Chris, tell us a little bit about your, your story. I gave a very brief synopsis of your, your time in the military, but maybe you just want to give a, a, a kind of life story. Tell us where you were born and how you got into this and what your involvement is in, in Africa and the world now. Sure, absolutely, Gareth. It's my pleasure. Uh, let's see. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, or as people in Baltimore say, Balmer in the state of Merlin. <laughs> so <laughs> accents, which actually has played pretty, pretty, pretty well in my life because People have very distinct accents. You can travel 15 kilometers and pick up four different distinct accents. And if your ear is attuned to it, you know where exactly people come from, this neighborhood and that sort of thing. And they're quite distinct. But uh, so I, I was born there and then uh, my parents moved across the country. I lived in 34 of the lower 48 states before the age of 16 and went to 38 mm -hmm. elementary and high and junior high schools, so primary schools. So I was constantly the new kid. I had to adjust, adapt. I was the outsider all the time. And um, it did have some impacts. Number one, um, I didn't really do so well in math and things like that, because every time I went to a new school, I was relearning what I'd already learned or they were advanced and I had no idea what they're doing. So I sat there kind of clueless. But uh, I kind of gravitated, gravitated towards things like history and political science and geography because it was easier for me to grasp. And that kind of played a role in where I went in life. So eventually I wound up in rural Appalachia in southeastern Ohio. And while I was in rural Appalachia, I was on a small dairy farm there and ran a dairy farm, about 17 acres. It must be about 12 or 15 hectares, I think, something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, milking the cows twice a day. I've been a farmer. So when South Africans ANC tells people that uh, millions of black South Africans want to be farmers, I know they're smoking something because uh, it's a tough life and uh, it's, uh, it's really not for everybody. I was great at it. And I enjoyed it. And it taught me great values and respect for hard work. But it's not something I want to do in my lifetime. While I was in high school, I had a couple of teachers uh, who said to me, hey, you should go to college. And I kind of laughed and said, how? I don't have any money. You have to understand at that time, uh, my, we were living on public assistance, uh, welfare. Uh, we had no electricity. I went to the to the bathroom at what we call an outhouse or outdoor privy, fetched mm -hmm. water from a cistern up the hill, carried it down these big plastic buckets. And you can imagine the dead of winter when it's uh, minus uh, 15 Fahrenheit, not Celsius, Fahrenheit. <laughs> so it's a lot colder than that. Uh, slosh, that water sloshing on your jeans as you walk down the hill and freezing to your jeans oh, before man. you stand there waiting for the school bus to pick you up. So that was kind of that. Also, I had kind of a strange childhood. For a while, I lived in a housing project in Maryland. There were 300 families. Three of them were white and uh, the rest were black. And so I lived in those circumstances growing up, moved to Buffalo, New York for a while, you know, coldest place I've ever been in my life. While I was in Buffalo, the um, my entire class for some reason was Puerto Rican. I have no idea why Puerto Ricans would leave beautiful, sunny, warm Puerto Rico and move to Buffalo, New York, where it's freezing, but they did. I didn't speak Spanish. I was just a little <laughs> kid. I was only there for a few months and they wouldn't talk to me during recess and break. I had no idea what they're saying. And I don't know if that fueled a desire for language, but later decided to learn it. While I was in high school, I went to study halls. We had free time and I'd go to the library and I look at gazetteers and atlases and read about countries and go, oh, Monaco, Monte Carlo, uh, Andorra, mm -hmm. Liechtenstein. I want to go there one day. Of course, I had right. no money. That's kind of hard to do. So 
the, the uh, high school teachers who motivated me to go to university said, well, just go to the guidance counselor's office. You know, if you don't have money, there's scholarships and grants. And sure enough, I went and uh, it isn't based on your skin color. It's based on income level. Uh, that's kind of a nice thing. So didn't have any income. And so when I actually got my financial aid paperwork back, I was distressed because <laughs> it said zero. I'm like, I don't get anything. How poor do you have to be? Well, oh, zero wow. means... Well, zero means what your family has to contribute to your education. So, so actually, oh. man, I got full, I got full <laughs> assistance. <laughs> okay, good relief. Yeah, exactly. Well, it took me it took me a little while to figure that out. But once I figured it out, so so I started university at the age of seventeen because I started first grade when I was five, uh, or before mm -hmm. I was five actually. And then uh, I I went for a year and spent a lot of time enjoying life and not going to enough classes and realizing after a year that. I was on other people's dimes and I wasn't really learning the things I should learn and I should come back when I'm ready. Plus, uh, the Army offered uh, money for education uh, that went towards it. So what I did is went back in the Army, went to Germany. I learned German in a few months, learned to speak it, and then went to classes to learn the grammar. Once I learned German, I started self-teaching myself off cons. And of course, the first question I got with off cons back in the 1980s is, what are you, a racist? I said, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the language of oppression. What do you mean? Well, mm -hmm. those racist white South Africans like you do realize that the majority of people who speak the language as a first speaker aren't even white. They're mixed race colored people in South Africa. Huh? No. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. yeah, it didn't didn't really sink in. So that's just kind of where languages started. I went from there. Uh, when I was in high school, one more piece to explain how I got to Africa. It was it was the time of liberation movements in Southern Africa, in particular with uh, Zapu and Zanu in Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, and then Mozambique. We had the FNLA under Holden Roberto and Jonas Savimbi with uh, UNITA and the MPLA. And then, of course, um, uh, Renamo and Ferlimo in uh, Mozamb or excuse me, Angola. Angola and Mozambique. Yeah, I said I got it backwards, so Angola and Mozambique. So I follow those things, reading newspapers each week as the stories came out about that. And then in high school, so you, book, must been in a, you must have been in the smallest of minorities because a lot of Americans didn't know anything about all that stuff. They just knew what was in the mainstream news about, you know, South Africa and the kind of the oppressive uh, racist regime that we had here. And, and that was the top line stuff. They didn't know about any of these liberation movements. They also didn't probably know about Cuba's involvement or Russia's involvement, except if they were in foreign policy, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're not going to find a rural Appalachian white boy high school student uh, interested in that sort of stuff. But for some reason, I was. Speaking of uh, of Cuba's involvement, Fred Bridgen's book came out a few years ago. I got this for a steal for $6.59. I have the original version. <laughs> I just got an updated Brilliant. one because it's got a new preface in it. But uh, one of the best books I ever read was fantastic. Talks about Cuba's involvement, 87, 88. But so, I, I, so in high school, there was a book. There was a famous American author who was a veteran of World War II. He wrote dozens of books, and he was known for historical fiction. As a historian, historical fiction is one of my favorite things. You take real events and real people, and you interweave them with fictional characters. Beautiful stuff. So James Michener is his name. His book was Hawaii, and then he had Chesapeake, Space, Texas, Poland, all these books. But in the late 70s, he came out with a book called The Covenant. And the covenant was about the the vow, the the vow that the uh, Trek Boers made at the Battle of Blood River, and they promised to build a church, uh, and they eventually did. A long time after that, in Peter Maritzburg, nowhere near the Blood River, but they did do it. And so I became fascinated in uh, in South Africa. I was like, this is a crazy place. It's so fascinating. All these different people: Kosa, Zulu, Venda, uh, Basutu, Siswati, Afrikaners. You know, it's wow, Portuguese. It's really so. That's where it grew from there, and I started following South African just kind of turned into that. Once I got in the army, I was sitting in uh, the education center in 1984 to sign up for a weekend class. Cause while I went in the army as an enlisted soldier, I did continue my education by going at night and weekends when it was possible, which was difficult because we were always deployed on exercise and such. But anyway, so I went there and I'm sitting and there's a little pamphlet on the table next to me while I'm waiting my turn. And it says the U S army foreign area officer program. I start leafing through. I'm like, well, they send you to graduate school for a degree in international studies or something like that. You go to school, to learn a language. Um, and you get to go overseas and work in an embassy or something like that for a year. Well, kind of like an Perfect. internship. I'm like, Perfect. well, that sounds, that's what I want to I mean, do when I grow up. So that's what I decided. <laughs> Uh, that's that's just incredible because so many people, um, and especially young people today, are looking for a vocation. They're looking for a calling. They're looking for a reason to get up in the morning and feel, especially in a country like ours, you know, where, where there's just no there's no sense of purpose for a lot of these young people. Mm. And and here it was that you found not only a sense of purpose, but that that sense of purpose in the military also nourished those other parts of you, a curiosity for language and 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 international relations and. And, and all the things that you were already passionate and interested in. Um, I, I wish that we had more stories like yours. We'd have many more productive and very well-adjusted, happy citizens, I think, if that was the case. 
I, I think you're probably right about that. It was, uh, but you know, the thing is, I made that decision in 1984. I already knew that I was going to get out of the army at some point as an enlisted soldier, return and get a commission because I wanted to be a leader. And I was a leader mm-hmm. as a non commissioned officer, but that's a very small uh, breadth of, ex- of of control. And I wanted to be a leader at a larger scale and, 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 and make decisions and guide people in the right direction. And so I wanted to become an officer. But this was a path to become an officer that held something potentially more interesting than just simply being a leader. So I decided right then, no kidding, I'll take, you know, as a counterintelligence agent, we were for smart. We say no statement, no poly, no waiver. So, <laughs> you know, we said no statement to the cops, no waiver of my rights, yeah. and I'm not taking a polygraph. But I would take a polygraph on this question. And that is that uh, in 1984, sitting in the education center, I walked out of there. I decided right then and there that I wanted to become a regular army officer. There's a distinction. Uh, most of our officers, when they come to active duty, are actually reserve officers brought on active duty. They later become right. regular. So I want to be a regular army, military intelligence foreign area officer for sub-Saharan Africa and make the rank of full colonel. All of that became true. The only thing that I wanted to do was that never happened was become the defense attache in Pretoria. And that unfortunate for me was the timing. The US Africa command and their infinite stupidity, I mean, wisdom decided that, uh, that they were going to change it from the army to a Navy position, just as I pinned on the Eagles for full colonel. So that was no longer possible. So I never got to do that. But I was stationed in Botswana right next door and, and was always in South Africa, but never got to be the defense attache in South Africa. But all the rest came true. I, I think that's a that's an amazing synopsis. And, and you know, it, we could talk about just those parts of your career, and I'm sure it would be fascinating for people to, to listen to. But the, the, the real reason that I wanted to talk to you is because you're so interested in what's going on in, in South Africa. You have a very good objective take i think because you're not from here because you've looked at it objectively without having without having to be emotionally or politically attached to the outcomes like so many south africans are so when you look at us and especially when you look at the events of the last couple of weeks where we've really had a bit of a wake-up call in civil society uh, in terms of our police in terms of our military in terms of our general security And all of this on top of the pandemic and on top of lockdowns and all kinds of government largesse. Uh, Now we're talking about people getting 350 rand a month until March next year. And believe it or not, there are people on the left who say that's that's not enough. Um, We need to look after people in perpetuity like children. It's amazing to me that all of this is going on. And there are still South Africans who are completely nonplussed by it. There are a lot of South Africans who who are... fanatical and crazy and, and, and pedantic and upset and emotional about it. There is no one really in the, the mainstream media who's looking at this responsibly and saying, this is actually what we need to do to get out of it. Now, how do you make sense of that as someone who's been watching things for a long time? And what kind of, what kind of advice do you have for people in power in South Africa and even for people who just are interested? Well, the first advice for people in power in South Africa is leave. <laughs> yeah, leave. You, you're the problem not the solution <laughs> that's the bottom line and while we're at it we could start with a man train cadaver right here in washington dc we could also go there and say the same thing yeah but, but seriously uh i think that the issue here is that there's a couple things in play number one a lot of the people who especially white liberals leftists uh who spew this nonsense have something to gain from it it's their livelihood they're either op-ed writers or they're commentators or they're in business and they're profiting from the fact that racist uh legislation like broad-based black economic empowerment are in place so they profit from it and it, it serves and, their purposes and, and, in, and in academia where they're oh protected. well I was, I was i was headed there yes yeah 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 yeah, they're, you're right. They're protected there and they can spew the, the most vile things and there's no consequences. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, first off, you don't have free speech in South Africa. Let's be honest about that, although we're, we seem to be losing it in America, too. But you, you obviously don't. If you had free speech, someone using an offensive Arabic word, which is associated with bad things, wouldn't become a felon and put in prison for uttering a word, particularly a person that is in distress and shock after having been nearly carjacked and then behaves poorly and winds up becoming mm-hmm. a felon. Of course, I'm speaking about mm-hmm. Vicky Momberg, not excusing right. her behavior, but but wo- woefully blown or ho- wholly blown out of context. The, 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 so my advice to South Africa. Chris, it seems the, the worst thing you can be in, in South Africa is an open racist. I mean, you could you could murder people uh, with with uh, with an edged weapon and you wouldn't be as reviled as someone who says a dirty word. Well, that's the thing that's really crazy. I mean, you know, are, are people's egos so fragile? Are their psyche so fragile that someone calling them names 
means that you have to prosecute them as felons and destroy their lives. I mean, that's really where it's at. And that's, that's, well, it's, that's unfortunate. It's a- average people, I don't think they are. I don't think they're even that bothered by someone who behaves badly like Vicky Momberg did. I think they, they would probably just write her off as is, you know, their decision. They could decide this is not someone we should take seriously or pay attention to. But the idea that it became such a big story shows you how easily South Africans can be distracted Yes. by nonsense that doesn't affect them really. Oh, it doesn't affect them at all. And, you know, in, in the normal circumstances, a uh, behavior like that, people that are, find it abhorrent, like I do, uh, would simply ignore the person or may, maybe yell at them and then walk away. And then and that's mm-hmm. the end of it. And then don't associate with people like that. Then, the, then the, the impact of what they're saying and doing doesn't reach anybody. But uh, this gets turned into something wholly larger. Meanwhile, Malema, Juju runs around and, and says the most vile things. His number three in the party at Seneca on the 20th of October stands up and switches from i believe it was zulu i could be wrong but uh switches from that to english to make sure that we all got the message burn the boar burn them out burn them down singing over and over again exhorting his um you know uh his uh what i would call it domestic terrorist outfit masquerading as a political party exhorting them to go burn down farms and within 72 hours 80, 92,000 hectares of farmland is torched in the free state. Thousands of wildlife and 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 cattle and sheep and such are killed. Uh, horrific damage and no charges. He can exhort his followers to go attack Clicks, a black owned, majority black owned business, because a black uh, person in the company made the stupid decision to take a um, a, uh, a rude disrespect, yeah, a rude disrespectful ad from Europe and apply no. the same thing because he was lazy to something in South Africa. And then they go and they attack 43 Clicks locations and petrol bombs one of them no charges you know, no arrest i i just want to stop you there not because i don't agree with you or not because what you're saying isn't true sure but because i know at this point that there are there are smart people who listen to to my shows and who've who've followed you know the stuff i've done on television and radio and who are listening to you and i having this conversation now and they're going oh right okay and right is exactly the word they're going these are right wingers <laughs> this is how these people talk. You know, anytime you have an opinion that, that just slightly differs from the mainstream left opinion, which seems to be the majority opinion in the world at the moment, in the Western world, um, then you are considered to be some kind of pariah. Whereas mm-hmm. you can almost without any co- controversy at all prove that the average South African is by and large a conservative, God-fearing person, black, white, whoever they may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that those people do not, by and large, espouse the values of the international left. Now, when you and I talk like this, there's also the danger that we're going to be labeled the the, the thing that I just mentioned, and that we're going to have this kind of content curtailed on the internet for, for whatever it's worth. Do you worry when you, when you express yourself the way you have just now about Malema or about the ANC or about the, uh, the Boers, for example, that you're going to find less and less audience to listen to the things that you have to say? Now, well, I, I worry that the the oligarchs, the tech titans will silence people. That's actually happened to me. I had a channel banned or blocked 16 years, not a single complaint on the channel. And then suddenly I become, become under attack from trolls, uh, many of whom are racist and uh, of, of white and black racist. And uh, I was targeted and I had videos removed that, uh, that had nothing going on. This was all because of the things I said. Uh, now, here's the thing. Um, what they're very, they're very convenient to uh, point out the reality here. Number one, I spent 36 and a half years supporting and defending the Constitution. I didn't do it for white Americans. I didn't do it for black Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic, Asians. I did it for Americans. To be an American is not to be white, black, or Asian, Hispanic, Native American. It's to be someone who espouses to an ideal. That's what right. America is about. We're an ideal. We're not an ethnicity. We're comprised of multiple ethnicities. And that really hurts their feelings. They're bum hurt about that. I mean, for instance, on my channel, I promote three languages in South Africa. And anytime I can talk to somebody in those languages, I try to get them on. And that's Tswana and uh, Basutu and then Afrikaans. I promote all three of those languages. Well, that just hurts their feelings because the folks that speak Tswana and, and Basutu aren't white. And so it doesn't fit the narrative. You know, I, I bring I bring on you know, heads of state. I bring on political leaders. I had... Uh, uh, well, this will help them with their argument, but they, they're right stuff. But uh, Dr. Peter Hrinovad was on my channel last week, uh, mm-hmm. but I have Bantu Holomisa on my channel. Uh, I'll bring anybody on that's interesting, but I also bring on folks like a small scale commercial farmer in Ghana who's dealing with land yeah. tenure issues, who's black. And uh, most of my guests actually are about half actually are black Africans because I cover the entire continent, but they conveniently forget that. 
you know, it was interesting mm-hmm. because I got attacked by the flying monkeys, as I like to call them on, on Twitter, which I try to stay away from. It's kind of a cancer, but you can't mm-hmm. help because people forge you things. You know, you're t- you, I heard you on your previous show talking about you get stuff forged to you all the time. Same here. Well, yeah. on, on, th- th- these are South African flying monkeys that do this, and, and most of them are white, so no one can claim that that's some sort of racist thing. But but uh, they start attacking me, and uh, one guy who happens to be black uh, says, yeah, this guy claims he speaks African language. He doesn't speak anything because he says Sawabona, so he thinks that I never claim to speak Zulu, by the way. I know what that means. It means I see you, but <laughs> watch out. But uh, anyway, so, um, you know, it's uh, I never claimed that. But the guy who said that I, I, I can't speak African languages and attacked me on Twitter misspelled Sawabona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, and he's a South no, African. Not, he's a South we're not, African. We're, we're certainly not going to get consistency or a lack of hypocrisy from, from the left. But let's just talk yeah. a little bit about where you were going here in terms of sure. your appraisal of South Africa's potential situation and and the situation that we're presently in um i'd like to just have you know your analysis from the years of experience that you've had in the military the understanding that you have of this part of the world um the people that you speak to where do you think we're at i mean if if you were a historian writing this chapter where would you start I would say that at this moment in time that South Africa is at a, a crossroads. It really is truly at a crossroads. Here's the problem. The African National Congress seems less and less of a party that's interested in governance and more and more a party that's interested in, to take a quote from Michaela Rong's book, uh, It's Our Turn to Eat. That seems to be what it's all about. You know, I was very mm-hmm. generous to the African National Congress all the way up until early 2018 after Ramaphosa took up. Now, I didn't fall for Ramaphoria, and I warned people that if he's serious, he has a very narrow window to make changes. But when his cabinet became full of Zuma stalwarts, it seemed pretty clear to me that he was just holding on to power because he barely got into power and that he was accommodating the Zuma faction and that he was not going to make any change. And in fact, arguably, the state capture is not only continued, it's it seems to be worse <laughs> than it was under Zuma. I mean, the PPE right. theft, all the loans that have disappeared, the $5.6 billion loan to South Africa. Yep. This is an inflection point. And here's the bottom line. There's a reason why former Deputy Chief Justice Mosaneki uh, recommended that it's unsafe to hold elections in South Africa, which is ludicrous. Uh, about 30 African countries have held elections during the pandemic, including the Central African Republic, a failed state, mm-hmm. and Somaliland, a country that only six other countries recognize. Yet they managed to hold successful, safe elections and not have super spreader events. So there's mm-hmm. a reason this is coming up. Now, uh, I, I spoke to Mark Oppenheimer this week on my program, and uh, I threw out there just, you know, his uh, red meat just to get a response. Uh, and I said that Mosineki's captured. And Mark defended Mosineki, and rightly so. He said he doesn't think he's captured, and that's fine. But it's very odd that a recommendation like that comes out. We've looked at other African elections. Which African elections do you look at? Most elections have gone forward. A few were delayed as the pandemic started, then they were they were commenced. Uh, even yep. Ethiopia, which is in the middle of a war, had an election. Now, you know, there's questions about that election. But the point is that South Africa, the most advanced, infrastructure, the most advanced telecommunications, the most advanced society on the continent, the wealthiest, throw out Nigeria's rebasing, but the wealthiest country in Africa, and it can't hold an election. People mm-hmm. stood in line for 13 hours on the 27th of April, 1994. People are standing in line for three yeah. days to get food in KZN now because but, of looting. But here's the thing. I mean, either it's Machiavellian and they've got a master plan and they're playing 4D chess with all of us, which I don't believe for a second because we're not dealing with sophisticated people here in the ANC. Nah, they're they're we're just, just idiots. Dealing with we're just dealing with thieves. And basically, what you're saying is that the election, they're hoping that their fortunes will change in the next few months. They're buying themselves a little more extra time. But it's not as if there's a nefarious plan afoot that's being masterminded by you know, some genius cabal within the ANC. There's none of that. They're as flat-footed as ever. I don't think that they intended to do damage that uh, that lockdown has done. They just did what all other governments, especially their, their friends in the international community, were suggesting they should do. Uh, they have no original ideas. And now they're looking at it going, oh, wow, we may, we may have screwed this up a little bit. But as soon as there's any pressure and the numbers go up again, they do exactly the same thing, just like people who've never learned a damn thing. Well... Exactly that. That's exactly my sentiments. Everything you said there. No, this is not nefarious. They're just incompetent. I mean, honestly, the, you know, I, I was, who was I talking to? I was talking to someone a couple of days ago about this. And, and the reality is that, um, or maybe it was Mark, I don't know, but uh, there's systems involved here. So last year on my channel, <clears throat> which before it was censored, I went from two subscribers in February last year because I just posted a couple of videos. Intelligence officer can't be posting videos over the internet, but uh, I did travel videos. And then when I retired from active service in late 20, uh, after the World Cup in 2019 in Japan, I, uh, I started uh, building my consultancy business and then COVID happened. So I started doing videos. And uh, I went uh, from May, 
with a thousand subscribers to November with 22,000. But then I started attacking my channel. But um, the thing I talked about is that uh, I did last year a lot of videos on the alcohol bans in South Africa. And the moment mm -hmm. the ban started, I said, wait a second, why are you banning the transport of alcohol? That doesn't make any sense. South Africa has a world-class wine exporting industry and people will count on that. And if you have, if you know anything, I'm not, I'm not an alcohol person, but I know about trade and business. And if yeah. you become an unreliable supplier for something that has cachet like wine, then you yeah. are not going to get that market. And this is exactly what happened. They banned them from taking the bottles in the Western Cape to the port, loading them on ships and sending them to Europe and to the US, which is in China, their major markets. Chris, and so what happened? We're, uh, we're not talking about, we're not talking about a, a government that understands second degree yeah. consequences or even yeah. first degree consequences, frankly. I mean, here they were, they just did what they thought was the, the most the, the basically all governments in the world that did this did it for the same reason they looked at it from a triage point of view and they said how can we make sure we get the least amount of blame for our decision and yep. by, yep. by locking yep. down countries really politicians were only covering their own asses that's what they were doing and everybody can see it now because the countries that didn't lock down like this are the ones who are now healthiest i mean sweden reported for the whole of this week not a single death um, and yep. that tells you yep. something. The countries that locked down are still reporting deaths, including the US and South Africa. And we've had our supposed third wave. Now they're already talking about a fourth wave. They're mm -hmm. saying the vaccines aren't going to work properly. I mean, talk about a way to scare people off of vaccines. If you tell them that there's a, a variant coming that, that might be stronger than the vaccines or that you have to keep wearing masks forever, that will turn even the most sensible person who's not at at any stage of their life been an anti-vaxxer into someone who's suspicious. They're like, well, what's the point of getting this then? Well, you're absolutely right. But but the thing that's frustrating for me, Gareth, is that you, you say that they, they, they're just reacting. They are exactly right. And this is the problem, the, the navel gazing by politicians in South Africa, in Washington, in London. I mean, Boris Johnson's been, turned out to be the most useless wow. uh, i mean since since john major he's the most useless conservative mp i'm the guy i think he has cognitive problems from when he got the rona because his decisions <laughs> since then have made it nonsensical i mean i really think he's lost some mental capacity there he's just he's out of it but yeah. no it's uh you're, you're right but the, here's the thing and you know since we're gonna talk about the uh the rona um you know it's it's Ever since the outset of this, they've all, when I say they, I'm talking about whether it's Jacinda Erhern in, in New Zealand or it's the Australian totalitarian fascist or the Germans or our leaders, mm -hmm. if we want to call them that, or yours. They've all treated as if, if we're, we're children. We're five years of age and they're going to decide what's done for us. And then they lie to us just to perpetuate the myths when they don't know what's going on. They don't have the strength of character to tell us the truth when they don't know. First off, right. it's kind of odd that just 21 days after a virus appears, we have a test that can identify it in 21 days. I'm, I'm not disputing that, but uh, I, look, I've spent the better part of three decades studying and, and working with uh, virology and epidemiology. And I, I fought HIV, tuberculosis, malaria programs all over Africa. And so this is not exactly something new to me. I'm my interest in hantavirus and, and Ebola and Lassa fever, things I've known about for a long time. Th this whole thing and when I say scam, people are going to go right wing. First off, let's make a distinction here. Conservative is not right wing. I'm a little sick of hearing that. I'm a little sick of hearing that. Just like just like Democrat in the U.S. is not left wing. A Democrat mm -hmm. is someone that's left of center and in the center. And, and a conservative is right. it's slightly to the right or in the center or both. It's not some, some nut job on both sides. It drives me nuts. But the reality here is that um, they have simply lied to us from the outset. Instead of having honesty, I mean, Dr. Fraud. You know, last year I had a video. I got a warning on my new channel. Yeah, Doctor Fauci. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Fraud. Uh, I got a warning on my on my uh, new channel because, um, or excuse me, I had a video taken down my old channel because, and that's the one that went away. And that's the video I deleted after they kept changing the rules on YouTube. And this video was me showing footage of Doctor Fauci in June of last year, saying herd immunity is sixty percent. Now, let's be honest. If you know anything about virology and epidemiology, the the concept of herd immunity is disputed, and that's always been disputed. And and I, I accept that. Sometimes for some diseases, because they're less virulent, it's forty percent of a population. Sometimes it's sixty percent. Sometimes it's more. But last year, not knowing anything, this clown comes out and says it's sixty percent. Once we have a vaccine and we get sixty percent, it'll be safe. Yeah. And then, you know, but then he I, said 65, I, I, 70, 75, 80, 85. I don't know about you, but I'm also sick of, of being accused by social media and by nutcases in, in society of, of spreading misinformation. This is a new word because we know what disinformation right. is, right? Disinformation sure. is, is, is when a foreign power or someone who seeks to subvert whatever you're in, if it's a, a you know sovereign country or whatever, they're trying to actively create chaos and confusion and sow division. That's mm -hmm. kind of what the Russians were doing for uh, Hillary Clinton in, in, in the 
the, the, the Donald Trump Hillary Clinton election. That's what we know they were doing. However, let's just put that aside for a second. Misinformation is something that ordinary people like you and I are accused of every single day just by having an opinion that differs from someone like Fauci's. Now, Fauci, it's worth pointing out, has changed his opinion on every conceivable thing to do with this coronavirus. And at different stages, if you were an alien who landed on the planet and you just listened to Fauci, who was supposedly the world's most respected guy at the CDC and the NIH for all of this, he at some point said, masks are pointless, don't bother with it. Then he said, you have to mask. Then he said, no, it's just political theater. Then he went back to, no, it's a good idea and you should mask around children as well and they should mask. He has occupied every position that you possibly could occupy and not a word about how he's spreading misinformation around. It's kind of hypocrisy, you know, it's hypocrisy writ large, right? And by contrast, last year when that uh, scam artist, Dr. Fauci, was was telling people misleading things, he knew what was going on with masks. And this is what I said last year before they made policies on this. And I said on my platform, I said, listen, um, people shouldn't be running out. This is in, in, in February, March of last year. I said, people should be running out and buying masks. I mean, there's panic going on now, toilet paper, paper towels, everything to snatch up yep. and hand exactly. sanitizer. You, you should, you shouldn't be running out and buying masks. I said, because masks are needed for first responders, for Correct. surgeons, for nurses and hospitals. So they don't infect patients who are vulnerable, whose immune system is compromised, you know, cancer patients or open heart surgery that those masks, the N95 masks have a limited supply. Only so much can be produced. 3M is the biggest producer. And I said, you shouldn't be rushing out and buying those things. You better off. If you want to stay, if you want to stay safe, use good hygiene. And that's what I said last year. That would be called misinformation. But you see, the Fauci defenders will say, "Well, that that was what he was trying to achieve, and that was probably yeah." That's like trying that's like trying to say that Cyril wasn't saying that white farmers aren't murdered and farmers aren't murdered in South Africa. But, but, the but, media. but to, to stick to this just for a second longer, because it may be boring to a lot of people, I don't know. But the fact <laughs> is, if he just said, if he'd said to us, "Look, I don't know," you know, maybe the masks will help, maybe they won't, but I can't tell you that definitively at the moment. It seems though that a lot of people are resorting to arguments from authority when they run out of really good arguments of every other kind. And that to me doesn't work. As an independent thinker, as someone who's not particularly interested in what the popular opinion is on most things, because if you want to get something almost almost always wrong, just ask a mob, right? I'm I'm, I'm asking questions. And a lot of these guys and girls who we look at and we we look to for the right answers and for, for trust, they themselves have been dismantling trust by talking absolute nonsense at every opportunity. And you can see through it because their motivation is power, influence, and importance. And I don't mm-hmm. think they want to let it go. You can see how much the politicians have enjoyed this uh, epidemic. All of them have oh. made sure they were paid. All of them yeah. have made sure that they kept their jobs. And all of them have made sure that everybody else has suffered. So, of course, they want to carry on doing this. There isn't a single one of these politicians, you can say, has suffered with the rest of us through all of this. Well, let me get two points before we get off this and we don't bore people too much. But the first is that, Mm -hmm. um, uh, listen, uh, I spent the better part of four decades, almost five decades being a pin cushion for the US government. I've had every vaccine you can possibly imagine. And before the audience asks the question, I'll tell you, I identify as vaccinated. If I can pick my gender, I can pick my vaccination status. So I identify (laughs) as vaccinated, just so everybody knows that. So you know, so you can guess whether I've had the jab or not. I may, I may not have, That's that's my personal business not South African government's PCR requirement to land in the country. But anyway, so here's the thing. Um, this this is really uh, frustrating because these people really, um, like you said, they, they they just mislead us all along the way. The, but they create distrust. All that I know about pandemics mm-hmm. and about epidemics, and all I know about virology and epidemiology, which I've studied for four decades and been involved with, all the things I know, we've done everything completely opposite. And all we get is power and authority and telling us that we're wrong and we're children. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have a pandemic, you isolate the vulnerable, the elderly, those with underlying health conditions. You protect them with physical barriers or with other measures. You isolate them. And then you quarantine the infected. We had leper colonies for a reason. They may have been inhumane, but they worked. Mm-hmm. We put lepers in the leper colony so they couldn't spread it. 
you know, tuberculosis is far more infectious than this virus. And we're not locking up TB patients who are active, you know, although maybe we should, but but <laughs> not advocating that. But the point is, they've lied to us all along the way. And then we see South Africa. Let's look at South Africa. Okay, here are the actions that they took. The minister of no trade, Ibrahim Patel, comes out with a ban on e-commerce. If you don't want people to show up and rock up in shopping malls and buy things in close contact with people, what's the best way to avoid it? Well, go to e-commerce. There's somebody in a warehouse. It goes down a belt. They wear gloves. It goes on a belt. They label it. They stick it in the mail. Someone takes it, they deliver it, you pick it up, and no one touches it, and there's no spread of disease. How? And, but they banned You know what his response was? Well, it's not fair to bricks and mortars. I submit to you, Gareth, that after 30 years after Mark Anderson released Mosaic at University of Illinois Carbondale and brought the new age of the internet, which I was on for a decade before that and longer, but brought the new age of the internet in 1994 with Mosaic, if you are a business today and you do not have a web presence, no one deserves, you don't deserve protection. You know, that's yeah. too bad. That's your fault for being three decades oh, behind the curve. Oh, yeah, but, but let's not let's not use Ibrahim Patel as an example of someone who, well, I, who even tried to more. do the right thing. We, we know that he's he's informed by an ideology that has failed more times than you or I have at, at a game of cards in a casino. So let's just <laughs> let's just give up on that for a minute. I okay. still want to know what you think of what happened in KZN and what you think sure. of what happened in, in Gauteng, the, the, the violent looting, the protesting. Uh, in inverted commas, uh, you know, the, the the general state of chaos that erupted. And in in particular, I want to know what your thoughts are around the intelligence that clearly was not present and was not shared with people who needed to make decisions in order to prevent all of this destruction that we saw. Well, this is where I was going with with what the government does, particularly in South Africa. And here is that they they destroy trust. Uh, my trust and confidence in in the leadership of South Africa is non-existent. Anything they say is suspect at this point because they've proven that they either lie to us, they mislead us, or they intentionally hide things. So, what happened in KZN? Well, first off, and this is not boastful, people can go back on my new YouTube channel and watch my videos as I did this. Is working 12, 16 hours a day as these events unfolded from the 29th of June when Jacob Zuma was convicted by the Constitutional Court for contempt of court for the very state capture commission that he created and the judge that he appointed. Anyway, so um, from that time forward, I, I pretty much predicted almost everything was going to happen, not to the degree. I had no idea that 100,000 people were going to run around and loot, but I knew that there was going to be chaos and there would be an effort to create um, the appearance that the country is ungovernable. Uh, what people have to understand is that the ANC has an internal factional war. Cyril Ramaphosa came to power by 70 votes in the party Congress. 36 votes the other direction, he wouldn't have been the president. It would have been in Kozizani Dalaminzuma. And this is the fight between those who want to steal and want to chase all the minorities into the ocean and nationalize everything because they don't know a better solution to life, and a fight between others in the party, some legitimate, committed to a multiracial capital market-based society, some who are leftists, some who just don't like the Zuma faction. But, you know, Ramaphosa doesn't really have a, a coalition. It's just everybody that doesn't want the Zuma side, and they're slight in the majority. I've argued that as long as it stays that way, South Africa has a chance. But when the balance goes from 60 to 40 to 50-50 or worse uh, towards the Zuma faction and the state capture, we're in trouble. And we're at that stage. Now, what happened in KZN when, when Zuma was given in five days to get his affairs in order, and he was supposed to turn himself in. He didn't do it. Nothing was done. Three days, the police were supposed to issue a warrant and arrest him. Nothing was done. Mm -hmm. They allow this to build up. And when they let Carl Niehaus, or as we call him now, Carl Nyhorse, <laughs> but uh, yeah. international media. But, yeah, but Carl, <laughs> when Niehaus had his little press conference there and nothing was done about that with no social distancing. Now, uh, he he had all these people there. And then, then Zuma goes out on the Friday and walks with his followers the same day that his legal team puts a request for rescission. He says, I'm elderly, I'm unhealthy, I'll die in prison. It's unfair, it's inhumane. And then right. on the Sunday, when he's supposed to turn himself in, instead of turning himself in, he holds court. He has thousands of people show up. The police do nothing. And that's when I made the prediction that this culture of impunity that the African National Congress has permitted between the EFF and Senate call, the EFF and Pretoria just before that, the week before, threatening the South African Health Products uh, Association if they don't approve the Chinese and Russian vaccines, that they'll make the country ungovernable. 6,000 people showing up, no social distancing, no mask for the yeah. most part, toy yes. toying, we, acting like fools. Much, there wasn't even much media coverage of that, by the way. No, there was no media coverage. And speaking of no media coverage, when Senate call happened on the 6th of October for the hearing last year, the only person I know that covered that event was me. And ENCA. ENCA was there, but nobody else, no South African media was there. 
And I, I'm not even in South Africa. I covered the event. I was taking social media feeds of people bringing in and trying to prove the problem. Something doing it. Mm -hmm. I did a, a six hour live stream. Now on the 20th, because people sense blood in the water, the sharks were circling, and the all the media showed up, and all the other all the, uh, the YouTube personalities showed up. But the point is that um, is that the media is complicit in, in all this. They, the the uh, you know one of the things I said about South Africa a few years ago when I was still generous, I said is that one of the strengths of South Africa is it has some strong institutions, the courts, the media. But the media have become captured too. I mean, News 24, even the Mail and Guardian, very disappointing. Uh, even Daily Maverick, I would say that a third of the things in Daily Maverick now are very much um, parroting what the government tells them they're supposed to say. Now, whether I'm not saying that they're handed, uh, you know, here's here's your marching orders for today. I'm not saying that, but clearly they're they're saying what the government. And notice how this unfolded. How when the government said something, the media says the same thing within minutes, and they repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. But what bothers me about this, Gareth, is that I predicted these events. I predicted attacks on infrastructure. Now. Now, one thing I did predict never came true, thank goodness, uh, in the midst of this, after Ramaphosa failed to show up for eight, nine days, didn't even talk about it, it's yeah. an afterthought, when he said, oh, you've been angry, naughty children, oh, he's talking about his party, angry, naughty children, when you've been bad South Africans, you have to stay locked up for two more weeks, oh, by the way, we won't tolerate, we won't tolerate um, looting, well, he says that, People are looting out of video, on video live, it's hilarious, so, so, so they allow this culture of impunity, when that was going on, they did nothing to stop it. And 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 I there's one thing that didn't come true, and I'm, thankfully this didn't happen, is I told people that when the violence was happening in Hautang and Soweto and in and, and Hillbrow and other places, and also even to the east of Pretoria, there was something. I said they need to get security at OR Tambo and King Shaka because the airports will be attacked. They're going to attack communications towers. They're going to attack water treatment facilities. They're going to attack radio stations. Well, I didn't say radio stations. I, I that, that'll be a false statement. Well, I never claim they attack radio stations, but they did. Well, and Hearing people say that this was not orchestrated, and I'm not claiming it is, but certainly people who have ill will took advantage of this now, to destroy how, infrastructure. How orchestrated? Let's just talk about this because yeah. compared to our, con our comments earlier about lockdowns and how that was just incompetence and you know kind of hand, hand over, over fist stupidity rather than anything else, this seems, and, and it's, it sounds conspiratorial to say this, but this seems like there was a network of people. In fact, most of the mainstream media are now buying into the fact that they were these masterminds and that they were they were actively running WhatsApp groups, sending out instructions to people who were then creating the conditions for chaos. They weren't necessarily in in charge of the mobs of people who were who were just taking advantage of the madness and and who very many of them are, are not necessarily criminal people every day of the week, but they saw an opportunity to become criminal. And get away with it. Um, now, now, who do you think these people are? Because we've heard all kinds of crazy theories from people that you know it's outside actors, it's it's foreign governments. The ANC has always been quite keen to label you know Western democracies as being the guys behind the throne, kind of making sure that that things don't go their way, despite their own obvious incompetence in almost every way, shape, and form. But is it? Is it just the Zuma faction here in South Africa? Is it part of the intelligence community in South Africa? Is it uh, the, the taxi industry? We know that they've teamed up with the right side in, in, in much of this. Who do you suspect they are? Well, first off, I don't buy for a second the government coming out, well, we have 12 ringleaders and we're going to round them up. We've identified 12 instigators. Mm -hmm. And then we see them charged with, you know, spreading malicious information and inciting violence, that sort of thing, not with being ringleaders. I, I don't trust it all because because the, the same government that comes out and says, oh, we didn't know, we were blindsided. There was no intelligence. People in their own government are like, uh, at the same time, having other press conferences saying, we gave this report, we told people about this. Now, having worked in intelligence at the highest levels in our community and worked with international actors, um, I can tell you that uh, a lot of people in intelligence, unless you happen to be particularly influential, it doesn't matter if you get the call right, it's not going to be heard. You, you've got to have the ear of the leader. And I don't know the current status of who has the ear of the ANC's leadership. I doubt the intelligence services do. So that may have played a role in this. But but uh, I don't buy ringleader sort of thing. I, I you know, some people go back and well, look, Julius Malema, back at Chile, and Ace Magashul all rocked up in Inconla to visit. Yeah, they were building an anti- Realm oppose a coalition politically. I, I don't buy that they were organizing a coup. It would have been too easy to, you know, to listen in on that conversation, those conversations and do something about it. I think this was all to show that Zuma was still an important figure and they're trying to build a coalition to oust. You know, I mean, it, look, if, if, if the members of the ANC who were in parliament were voted directly, now I'm not arguing in favor of direct elections in South Africa, although I think it would help right. somewhat, but we have direct elections and we have problems. But anyway, but but if, if the people who are in parliament had to answer to voters, mm -hmm. there would be 
a no confidence vote. And unlike Zuma surviving nine of them, Ramaphosa would go down in a heap of flames right now. There's no way he would survive now, but they're not. They're, so the, the members of, of the ANC are not loyal to the voters. They're loyal to the Thule House because that's who picks them for those positions in parliament. So they're not going to break the party line. You've just made me think of something. What about this argument that we hear from so many people who are, who are you know, the, the real commentariat? These are the people who say, well, Cyril Ramaphosa might be bad and he might be a weak leader and he might not be making the right decisions. And I have no personal truck with him. I've got to be very clear. I mean, I have never had a reason to dislike Cyril Ramaphosa on a personal basis. I think he's probably quite a nice, genuine, warm, friendly person. He seems to have had good relationships with almost everybody in business during his time there and in the trade unions during his time there. I think he's just trying to be friends with everyone, which is impossible in politics. Nonetheless, there are these people in the commentariat who will say to us, he's trying his best, but he is still the best of a bad bunch. And if he doesn't stay, and if, if he's no longer our president, we're in for a much worse time with the likes of Didi Mabuza and, and the rest of the ANC. Do you buy that? Do you think that's a good argument? Well, my question is, where are the actual real people in the ANC that can that did something useful, like Trevor Manuel? You know, people like that actually did something useful in their day. You know, um, there were legitimate leaders in the ANC, but I see a dearth of leadership in the ANC. I mean, look, Cyril Ramaphosa couldn't lead a crash of kindergartners to free ice cream at lunchtime. You know, he couldn't do that. He, that's he's not a leader. He's not even remotely a leader. You know, this this Ramaphoria about him about you know, when he came to power. Oh, he's a brilliant businessman. Listen, you give me three or four hundred million dollars in equity handed to me, and after twenty seven years, it'll be four billion or more. I know how to invest right. and save. This guy is worth the same amount of money that he was handed. So that's that's just all nonsense. No, um, it, it is frightening because the ANC doesn't have anybody on the bench. I mean, what are we going to turn to? Enkoza Zani, Dalami Zuma, Ace Magashule, <laughs> Zandili Gumeda. Come on. This is this is this is a bankrupt party, bankrupt in leadership, bankrupt in okay. ideas. So, yeah. So then so then let's let's turn our, ourselves away from the ANC. So what what happens in opposition politics? You know what's going on there. You also watch that very closely. You mentioned the EFF already. You haven't mentioned the DA. There's also the IFP, and there are a couple of other small parties. Is there any possibility that those guys could rally together and make something out of nothing? All right. This is what I've said since last year when we knew the municipal elections were coming. Let's hope they happen on the 27th of October. But but uh, I've been saying this no, endlessly. They're going to be they're gonna be in February now. No, that's not acceptable. You want riots? <laughs> that's not acceptable. But, but, but it's not going to happen because South Africans they're are apathetic. Good. They're just going to roll over. But um, it's really sad. The real issue South Africans are apathetic of all ethnicities. But this is what I've told people since last year. And 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 I will, first off, I'm very critical of all the opposition parties. I think they're mm -hmm. largely clueless, useless. So and, we. And, yeah. and, and I think that many of them like their privilege and blue light escorts and, and salaries and secretaries and travel just like mm -hmm. the ANC does. So let's be honest about that for starters. I think the number of people that sit in parliament that are true patriotic South Africans, I don't want to say can be counted on one hand, but it won't take a lot of hands to count them. And that's from all the parties. That's pretty sad. I could say the same thing here in the States. Democrats, Republicans throw most of them out. But, but this is what I've told people, and this is the path forward potentially. People need to go vote in municipal elections. Traditionally, and it's not just in South Africa. This is pretty consistent around the globe, especially here. Uh, but 31 to 38 percent of those eligible actually rock up to vote for municipal elections. It's lower than national elections because the issues are local and people just kind of, yeah. you know. So, so first off, an opposition party can win an outright majority with a handful of votes in municipality. Yeah, they can't. Right. So, for instance... A lot of these places in the margins, a few hundred votes at most. Ex well, let me give an example here. So in Nelson Mandela Bay, in 2011, the DA had 9,000 more votes than they got in 2016. But in 2016, because the vote turnout was lower, they almost got an outright majority. They didn't, so they had to go into coalition with parties who were interested in their turn to eat, not in governance. And we had a corrupt deputy mayor who they fired. And Athel Trial, who I think is, uh, is a personal view, and not everybody agrees with me, but I think is one of the most brilliant uh, mayors that South Africa has seen. Of course, I thought Helen Zillow when she was in Cape Town was brilliant as well, if not the best. But Athel Trollope did an amazing job. Nelson Mandela Bay services actually started to work in parts of the city, especially in places mm -hmm. where people of color live that hadn't seen in ages. But they had to fight a rear guard action the entire time. Just, he spent a third or half his energy keeping the coalition together. And eventually they lost power. And then the ANC started looting once again. Now they've come back mm -hmm. in power. So my argument has been this. In the places where an, op an opposition party in South Africa has a legitimate chance of winning an outright majority, hold your nose. Vote 
for that party. And in most cases, almost all cases, that's going to be the Democratic Alliance. I'm not shilling for the Democratic Alliance. I'm just telling you, you need to do this. And I'll explain why. I'll explain why you need to do this. You need to, in 2021, get opposition parties in control of as many metros as you can so they can focus on service delivery and honest governance so that when 2023 comes, you have a chance. And I'm so sick of hearing South Africans say, well, the ANC will always have a vote. Because the underlying current there is to always have the black vote. Well, what the yeah, hell is I a mean, black that's, vote? That, that's not true. And and I agree with you. I think first of all, that's that's hugely patronizing of black people to consider Indeed. that they don't they don't think about and don't care about who they're voting for. And it's while they may be older, there may be older people in, in South Africa who feel a, a kind of connection, an emotional and, and and spiritual connection to the ANC. We've seen in election after election that their majority has been diminishing. So the, the, the data is against you, I'm afraid. Yep. Yep. Let's, let's Not against talk me, about, against them. <laughs> no, against them, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. talking about uh, your, your position here. So, Chris, there's a, there's a lot we could cover, and I, I, don't, want to, uh, I don't want to take the, the whole of this discussion um, to just look at South Africa. I find your, sure. your points yeah. of view here very interesting and probably a lot more clear than some of the points of view that I read in the mainstream media in South Africa. That's not to demonize them. There are good people who are writing interesting things too. And there's some very, very interesting citizens who do op-eds too that are yep. extraordinarily clear. Um, let's talk about your home country for a second because America and South Africa are linked in more ways than we may have thought they were. I mean, there are, there are movements afoot in the United States which we've already had experience of, you know, sort of the roads must fall, which turned into fees must fall. That kind of thing is picked up in American colleges in a big way. There are also elements of, of South Africa's racial divide, which are being exploited in the United States in a way that uh, people thought race relations were better before Barack Obama than afterwards. What do you think is going on in America at the moment? And how do you make sense of that for people who are not living there? Well, that's those are fantastic questions. First off, I'd like to say I agree 100% with you. Race relations were better in America before Barack Obama. He was the race merchant uh, in charge, no doubt about it. His idiotic nonsense. People will, people will blame Trump, right? They'll say Trump brought the racism no. back. No, 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 no. They're not paying attention. I said this. I, mean, I said it in private because I couldn't say it publicly because I was commissioned officer. So, you know, I couldn't say it. But privately, I said during Obama's term, he's the racist in chief. And he is the guy. I mean, listen, he grew up uber privileged. The guy had a, a very wonderful life that was handed to him in many respects. He didn't earn Jack. Um, and here's the thing. He lived in Indonesia. He lived in Hawaii. Oh, those tough life there, you know, and lived in privilege and wealth. And then he starts this nonsense. I could have been Trayvon Martin. Really? You could have been some thug that assaulted a guy on the street and got yourself killed. Mm -hmm. And then all this stuff, you know, with his, his you know, let's bring um, Dr. Henry Louis Gates together with the trooper who, you know, who, you know, they had an argument. No, Henry Louis Gates was being a bigoted racist and attacked the trooper because he's an arrogant ass. Um, he's a brilliant historian, but he's an arrogant ass. And he felt he was owed deference by the trooper. And he, and he just he acted like the fool. So we turn this into a race thing. Every opportunity, the Obama administration turned everything into race. First off, we have elderly white voters in Philadelphia who went to the polling station and the Black Panthers were standing at the door, which is illegal, by the way. You have to be 100 feet away from the door in, in Pennsylvania uh, from a polling station. They're standing there with nightsticks, with berets, and they intimidated them, chased the elderly white people away from voting. That's a civil rights violation. The Voting Rights Act applies to all Americans, not just people who happen to have dark skin pigmentation. When did that happen? This happened in the 2008 election, 2012 election, and the Obama administration, uh, they refused to investigate this. The justice, or as I call it, the Department of Injustice, and I still call it that, refused to investigate these cases of civil rights violations. They just dismissed it. And, and so you knew right there that the handwriting is on the wall. Civil rights are for all Americans, no matter what their hue is, not just for people who've been historically disadvantaged in the vernacular of South Africa. So Obama was the racist in chief. Everything is about race. Everything, everything. And, and it started, it was despicable, disgusting, because arguably race relations in this country had never been better to that point. Black Americans had been, and, and under, under Trump, this really changed. Black Americans have been closing the wage gap. Uh, income had disparity had reduced dramatically under Trump, especially, uh, even a little bit under Obama, despite all the challenges that weren't necessarily his fault. Uh, and we also saw that, um, that um, life expectancy for black males, which was abysmal, had increased over the past 30 years. And they were catching mm -hmm. up. You know, one of the sad truths about America is that Social Security, you can't start collecting it now, if you're my age, until you're like 69 um, unless you want to take a partial payment. But most black men don't live to be 69. Uh, they die in their 50s of heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, things like that. 
and, uh, and, and, and so they get defrauded by the social security system because they never get the money. But the point is that, is that this, 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 this whole issue, it wasn't behind us. There'll always be racist. I mean, people think it's, you stamp out, Ebola, uh, not Ebola, but uh, Corona. You're not. It's with us. It's going to be here. We have to find a way to live with it. You can't stamp out racism because there's always going to be idiots that have in their heart the fact that they think that there's first, there's different races. There aren't. We're all homo sapiens. Let's get that straight. Just different appearances. Uh, that's They believe that. And they believe that it's okay to act on that because one race is better than another. That's a racist. Uh, and you're always going to have idiots like that. That's in their heart. You can't change that. But most of what happens in society in South Africa, in the United States, in Europe, is not racism. It's bigotry. Bigotry is learned behavior. And bigotry can be unlearned. It might be hard. And I always give the example of All in the Family, which was an American sitcom back in the 1970s with Carol O'Connor as Archie Bunker. Right. He was the biggest bigot on the planet. You watch that show when it started out. He, um, Norman Mailers, I think, was one of the show. But um, he, he was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. So his wife was a dingbat. His daughter married a Polak. So he couldn't, you know, she's a female. Yeah. His neighbor He's was George Jefferson. Yeah. Right. Yeah, his, his 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 neighbor was George Jefferson. He all but said the N word because it was television, you know. And and he and, but he began to change and his bigotry. And as I watched this, I, this sunk into my head. Maybe that was a subliminal message. But Archie Bunker, the biggest bigot out there, uh, which was funny at the time in the vernacular, everybody laughed. But he began to change when he went to the hospital. And he had a blood transfusion. And he found out that Dota was black. He's like, oh, oh. And, yeah. and suddenly his character began to change. You realize that black people are just other people too. So most of what people complain about is bigotry. Unfortunately, everything becomes a racist, um, you know, oh, it's racist, it's racism. And what's most disturbing very, about what happened. It's very useful. It's very exploitable by people That's who are trying. Exactly right. Exactly right. To create and so division. That's what they do. So this is obviously a place where you can. You can drive up historical anxiety among white and black people and everybody in between because they go, oh, my God, that's not where we want to go. That would be retrogressive. And the problem is that the facts are uncomfortable. Here's the bottom line. Uh, white on black violence exists. It happens. But it's a footnote compared to black on white violence here in America. It's off the charts. And it's not reported on. You're lucky if you find anything that's reported in local press, let than national. But the moment that that it's the other way around it's a national story. And so let me give an example of what would stop being a national story almost instantaneously. I covered the two shootings that happened in Colorado this year. I, I cover all kinds of events. I did live coverage of it, gave analysis and commentary, which I typically do. And the one that was earlier this year, the second was in Arvada. And that's unfortunate because a good Samaritan got shot by a cop because he thought he was one of the thugs that actually saved cops' lives. But, uh, but not that one, the one previous to that. In that one, there was uh, a grocery store. And you may remember there was a shooting and the guy walked in the store and he shot a bunch of people. A police officer died. They drug him outside and you got a grainy picture from a distance and his shirt was up and he had a, a light skin pigmentation. The left went crazy. Look, it's another one of those loony right wing racist Trump supporter gun toting mass shooting. Take away guns. Yeah. January and, 6th. And, yeah. My <laughs> response. My response was uh, well, you talk about January 6th, too. I was there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my response was, well, first off let's if this was unfolding live i said we don't know who that is and i'm looking at that picture i mean it, it's grainy but that looks like a guy who's you know more olive skin than you know some white dude anyway so um, as it turns out they, they were all on the narrative that because they thought they had a racist narrative they found right. out that every single one of the people that was killed was white so they lost interest and then the shooter was actually a muslim immigrant from syria now he, he was born in syria he grew up here who mm. couldn't adjust to society he never fit in so once they found out that he was story, an arab and a muslim died, really. story died it, arabs a muslim arab and all white victims the story died like that but you put two people of color just like the atlanta thing oh it's a Haitian hate crime no the guy's got problems he well, shot i mean he shot let's not even talk about george, george floyd i mean you know if, if this guy if, if he wasn't shot, God knows what horrible things he'd be doing with it the rest of his life. He'd spent the first uh, half of it uh, doing nothing but, but, but criminal things and treating women like filth. But of course, now he's a hero because he was killed by a racist white cop. Um, I, wanted, I want to ask you quickly about January yeah. 6th because we've got sure. only a limited amount of time left. And you say you were there. And I'd like to know why you think they're making such a fuss of this when all that January 6th was, in my opinion was a huge security failure by the yeah. bureaucracy yeah. of the mayor of, of of Washington, Capitol Police, the people who should have been in charge of that situation from the get-go. They should have known what they were up against. They should have been able to sort out the problem instantly. It seems to me that this is being milked to the nth degree by how many commissions have we had already? This is the third one, I think. And, and I've got to ask you why you think this is being brought forward again and again and again. 
what's the point? There was one person killed, and that person was uh, was the, one of the protesters, one of the the Trump supporters, supposedly. The yep. the cop who died didn't die there because of that, and and we we know that all the other deaths have been exaggerated, and they've been found to have not necessarily occurred because of events that happened there on that day. But nobody's talking about that. Why? Well, there's a few purposes. Number one, it's perfectly fits into the narrative to demonize Donald Trump and uh, use him. I, I listened to the testimony of Officer Dunn yesterday, who's disgraced mm -hmm. his uniform. Listen, I support law enforcement. I back the I back the blue, so to speak. Always have you respect law enforcement as long as they obey the law on themselves and they're not corrupt. Uh, Officer Dunn, I'm not saying he's corrupt, but his testimony was entirely political. It was all utter nonsense, going on and on about uh, what uh, from his perspective it was is. No, the, 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 so, so, and he threw race in there. He comes up, yeah, oh, no, they call me the N-word. I've never been called the N-word before. I have to seek counseling now. You know, uh, this thing, we, we got messages before it happened, and we and were told that they were organizing, and that they got their marching orders from Trump. I'm like, there were half a million people there. I don't know what he's talking about. I didn't even know there was a Trump rally till the day before, and I'm a journalist covering the events. I went to D.C. to cover the lawful assembly to seek redress from our government by five permits issued by the Capitol Police to groups on foolishly on the east and west steps of the Capitol. I didn't know they did on the east steps. So I went there to cover those events. And the day before yeah. I saw that Trump was having a rally. So since I wanted to avoid traffic, I, and I actually wound up in a lot of traffic, and I drove down. It's a two-hour drive without traffic. I drove down and I got there early and I went to the Trump rally and I was looking for things as journalists. I looked for Confederate flags because I knew that was going to be our play. I looked at the ethnicity of the crowd because I knew that was going to be a topic. And there were at least 10,000 Asians there complaining about China and in favor of Trump in just one spot by the African American History Museum. There were black Americans. There were lots of Hispanic Americans there and there were white Americans. So I looked for that. I looked for the police and security presence because uh, someone that did that, that's, I'm always looking to see that right. just to make sure nothing takes away. And I walked everywhere that day. I walked through the crowd in front of the lips that it was got a little bit of tight there. I walked. I was up at the Washington uh, Monument. I walked down the mall. I went to the Capitol building. Half a million people show up, peacefully demonstrate. No trash left behind, by and large. People behaving themselves. No cars vandalized. No shops looted. Nothing. Also, no National Guard. And Muriel Bowser went through the whole, you know, um, you know virtue signaling. I have ordered the National Guard to active duty. She has mm -hmm. over 3,000 guards, but 3,800. She ordered 100. I saw two sitting in a car, staying warm wow. the entire day. That doesn't mean they weren't there. They might have been a you know reserve force, but they but then the general comes out with his virtue saying, Well, the Pentagon denied me a, a reaction force. Well, what kind of reaction force are you gonna have when your your mayor is the one that activates your forces and she activated a hundred? You can't respond anyway. So um, so the narrative here is that they it, it falls perfectly into demonizing Donald Trump. They also use it for the race thing. Oh, they're all white MAGA supporters. Yet I have in video black guys trying to exhort the crowd to violence, and we're standing there going, What's wrong with you? Leave the cops alone. People saying that, you know, stand right, right in front of where all the pepper spray and things were going on. Uh, it's, it's so that's the other thing that's going on here. And then the third thing is it's fear. They want to control people. I mean, listen, it is embarrassing for me that my nation's capital was under military occupation for five months, five months yeah, I mean, with fences in front of the camp for no threat, no on, threat whatsoever. On that day. People like me who, who love the United States and, and the things that it stands for, the idea that you were talking about earlier, found ourselves completely horrified to see that the, the, the foremost democracy in the world and the country that many other countries look to as a source of freedom, even countries like Cuba, who are busy parading the American flag in protests because they know what America stands for, to have to see this going on at the seat of power in America, it's just outrageous. It was very, very embarrassing. What is embarrassing, what is outrageous is the following. No police presence whatsoever. Anytime there's any kind of event, a million man march or uh, the every year for the right to life march, there are thousands of law enforcement officials from surrounding counties, county sheriffs, local metro police departments, D.C. cops, Northern Virginia cops, Par National Park Police, Federal Bureau Investigation. You see them everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. There were no cops, Gareth. No cops, just like the uh, like the, the the Die Hard movie in New York. There, the third one, whatever it was, when John McClane is in the streets of kids trying to steal a chocolate bar. He goes, "Hey, you want to go to juvie for stealing an old Henry bar?" He goes, "Look around, man. The cops are into something. It's Christmas." And that's exactly what happened. I saw <laughs> only about four dozen cops on the steps of the Capitol building, with ten thousand people standing in front of them before Congress even went into session, because I got over there just right about one o'clock was when it started. And they're all that. By the time I left there at about 20 after two, just before apparently the break-in occurred, um, there were at least a quarter million people at the Capitol building on the West side. Um, a lot of people from Trump never came back there. You know, and, and they, they say this, well, Trump told his people to get really, so Trump, 
uh, managed to tell his supporters from all over the country who drove from all the country, flew from all over the country to arrive there and do this. Now, if a quarter million people were out there, but let's just say it was 10,000, why is it only three or 400 people went into the Capitol building? And why is it that they were able to break into the building and nobody did anything? There was a false flag operation going on there. I have videos showing people who were not Trump supporters who I, I'm asking questions. I have this young guy in front of me, Gareth, who's like, man, get, get in there, man. If you don't do something, you're all pussies. Get in there. And it's some guys stand next to me. We're just, I'm just like amazed at this. I'm about 20 feet, about five mm -hmm. meters, seven meters away from where the police line is. Um, and, and all they're using are bike racks to separate people. They had a tower there for the television to do the inauguration. They didn't secure it or guard it. They let people climb up on it. So people were above the cops looking down on them. They could have killed them. This is how inept it was. It was intentional. They intentionally did this. But anyway, so this young, this guy stand next to me he goes, what do you think of this? I said, well, first off, this guy's a, a, a dipshit. <laughs> this is an idiot. Uh, and, and, and the young kid's like, get in there. And I looked at him. I said, hey, listen, Rocco, how many combat tours you got on your belt? Uh, uh, none, sir. I said, I didn't think so. Stop harassing the police. And he kind of sulked away. But he had like body armor on, a little Kevlar helmet. There were none of those people there when I arrived. But at some point, I would say at about quarter to two, I started noticing people showing him ones and twos wearing goggles and, and Kevlar helmets and body armor and working their way around the crowd. And then uh, after two, I heard somebody say, hey, hey, there's a side door. And at that point, I saw people start waving arms. And about 20 people broke from the crowd, went around the south side of the Capitol building. And I don't know what they did, but... Now, that doesn't mean there weren't Trump supporters that did stupid things, no, that course. trespassed. But, but, but the but point what I'm is interested there, in, yeah, yeah. what I'm interested in, I mean, these are all uh, amazing stories you're telling me. And you know what's going to happen is people are going to say, oh, bullshit. You, you're talking nonsense because, of course, I have the footage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know but people are going to say that anyway. And I'm sure that we can go and look at your footage and some people will and some people won't. They'll say, well, no, we know Chris. He's an he's an he's a nutcase because that's how they dismiss you. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's being used now, though. Uh, as as the the evidence of an insurrection of dangerous people who need to be um, who need to be watched like domestic terrorists and in South Africa we see Cyril saying similar things using yeah. the term insurrection and I'm just worried that this is an excuse in South Africa as it's been in America for the ANC's uh, very worst excesses to be used against people who they find inconvenient that's Absolutely. my concern and I think no, that's the concern yeah. of Americans. Your concern's spot on. I mean, one of the most Orwellian chilling things that Sir Ramaphosa said is that people spreading false information, excuse me, on social media. Uh, yep. Listen, where the hell was the government at warning people that the N3 was unsafe to drive on? Where were they on the radio giving public service? Now, do where not go on the N3. What's that? Yeah, where was their good information if they were so right, worried there, about it? Was, it, was, it was non-existent. The president, they provided the president, no information. The president arrived, what, a couple of days later to say something for the first time. Please do me a nine, favor. Nine, nine days later, he arrived. Nine days. By the way, I'm sick of hearing this was a five-day event. This was an 11-day event. It unfolded from the 8th to about the 17th. This is ridiculous. Um, but no, Ramaphosa shows up almost 10 days in the whole thing. He finally shows up. Uh, we, we see, anyway, it's, so it just, it just drives me nuts that, that he says this because right. this is an attempt to silence people. And the same thing happens here. I, you want an I, insurrection? I, there was an insurrection last year in the United States. There was. Yeah. It's called the mm -hmm. Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. People declared an independent oh, yeah. country in right. Seattle and broke away from this country. Not a single person arrested for insurrection. Not a single person arrested for the violence that occurred there, the murders that occurred there. Not a single person arrested for treason against America. Yet we're, we got mm -hmm. we got people who criminally trespassed and caused a chaos at the Capitol building, a handful of people out of a half a million, and we're told it's an insurrection. Listen, if that's an insurrection, if that's the Capitol Police that responds, then I don't want them defending an ice cream stand. Hmm. So, Chris, uh, we really scratched the surface. I, I kind of suspected you and I would would see eye to eye on a lot of these subjects, but uh, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of places that we would disagree too. I just like the sure. fact that there is someone there's someone who's as interested in South Africa from the outside as we are from the inside, and uh, I appreciate your insights. I mean, I think this is a really uh, a controversial and interesting conversation that some people will. Will immediately dismiss. Some people will say, "Well, the, you know, they raised some interesting points." Some people will uh, will try to to uh, write you off as as a as a crackpot and a conspiracy theorist. You heard that before; it wouldn't hurt your feelings. And uh, and many people would say, "Well, you know, there's a there's a little bit of truth there that I think I need to explore a bit more." Just tell us where we can follow you, so that if if people are interested in what you're up to, then they can uh, they can pay more attention, and we'll get you back for another conversation soon. 
Well, that's fantastic. Thanks, like Gareth. Yeah, listen, uh, my new ch channel on YouTube is Chris Wyatt Africa. So just look up Chris Wyatt Africa on YouTube and you'll be able to find me. Feel free to become a subscriber. Uh, I really appreciate it. I had 22,000 subscribers and I was excited about my channel because I had a large audience that was international. I had listeners mm -hmm. in Nepal. I had viewers mm -hmm. in South Korea and, and not just South African expats, but people who are interested in the content because I cover all of Africa, not just South Africa. And uh, I have a big audience in the US, but most of that's gone because I have to self-censor what I say on YouTube. I can't talk about the pandemic in almost any terms. I can't talk about the election and what and the actual fraud that happened there. So um, and I'm not talking about Dominion changing votes. I'm talking about actual fraud in the state of Pennsylvania where they violated the law they announced it to. But uh, you can find me on YouTube. Also, Chris White Africa on Odyssey and Rumble, which seem to be less popular in South Africa. And then I have a podcast on Podbean called All Things Africa. And uh, I strip out uh, all the audio or all the video and put the audio up there and make uh, live streams and that. So that's that's where you can find me. I'm on Twitter and stuff like that. But if you find me on YouTube and Odyssey, then you'll find me in all the other platforms because all the details are underneath my videos. Brilliant. Chris, it's good to talk to you. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Bye, Donkey. Good to have this conversation. We'll speak to you again soon. Yep. Calibre. Very good. Very good. There's uh, That's Chris Wyatt. And... Um, he is uh, certainly an interesting man, got a lot of uh, really interesting points of view on South Africa and on America, and we didn't even get to, to touch on the rest of Africa, but maybe we'll do that at a future stage. Chris Wyatt, everybody.